Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. We love our community and want to show the love of Christ tangibly in our neighborhoods, workplaces, and homes. This summer, we will discover how serving can make a difference in our community, how serving makes an impact for God and grows our faith in a series called Why I Serve. We would love to hear from you and how God is using this message to give you a new perspective and hope. Email your story to church at rockbrook.org. Well, good morning, Rockbrook. So good to see you all. I spent last week with a bunch of our team uh, out at a church conference with uh, almost 300, or 3,000 rather, pastors and church leaders. And every time I do that, I got to tell you, it is so good to come back home and come back to Rockbrook Church. We have a unique church, friends. Just an amazing uh, place, more than a place, an amazing group of people and the unity that we get to enjoy and just the family that we get to be in here is absolutely awesome. We've got great days ahead, great ministry that we get to do. Serve Day is coming up, uh, July 14th. Looking forward to that. Love seeing the projects you guys are doing. Talked to a guy this week who he went to an apartment complex and just knocked on doors and asked, how can I help? And I thought, well, that's a great way to serve your neighbor, or how, how can you serve him? Ask him. So he just went and asked, and from that, they... I discovered a single mother who really needs some help, and that's their small group project. So hopefully your small group has uh, got a project going. You can register that. And you can go to rockbrook.org slash serve day. Sign up for a project. Come on, don't miss this day of serving your community. We're going to get our hands dirty that day and help one another and make a difference in our community. You don't want to miss that. And uh, I know you don't. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. You want to love other people. And that's why you come to Rockbrook, because that's our, it's our desire to do that. Uh, so we can move forward with that together. We've also been talking about serving in our weekend services. And this series has really come together just as we talk about serving in different aspects of our life. And I hope you've been challenged by it. Today we're going to talk about how we see our jobs, how we see our work. This is an important topic, because you're going to spend a lot of... Our, of your life. We're going to spend a lot of our life working. The average person will spend somewhere around 100,000 hours of their life at a job working. Work defines our lives. Work dominates our lives. Work describes our lives. But surveys and studies tell us that about two-thirds of people say they do not like their job. They're unfulfilled, unsatisfied, and they don't like their job. And some people think that work is actually a punishment from God. And where they get that is the Bible says that after sin entered the world, God cursed the ground and kicked mankind out of the Garden of Eden and said, now you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. That's the line that he, he gave. And that's true. But before sin entered the world, before the fall, before mankind was separated from God, Genesis 2.15 tells us the Lord God took the man. Do we have this verse? The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Say it to work it and take care of it. So even in paradise, when everything was exactly the way God wanted it to be, there was work. God had work as a part of his plan. So the result of sin is not work. The result of sin is harder work. The result of sin is that work is painful at times. The, but the, the, Jesus said uh, that, that he works. He said, my father is always working and I am working too. And because we're created in God's image, we work. Did you know that you're going to work in heaven? I said that last night and there were a couple of groans. <laughs> but God has work for you to do in heaven. Only in heaven it's going to be good work. It's going to be fulfilling work. No bad bosses, no inner office politics. Your work in heaven will be fulfilling. It, it'll be fun. You'll want to work. So work is not the enemy of your life. Work is an amazing opportunity of life. What kind of opportunity is it? What kind of opportunity is work in our life? Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do. Now there's a lot of whatever you do is represented in this room today, especially over the course of five services. 
A lot of, of, of whatever you do. It's different jobs represented. What's the transferable principle for all of them? What If you're a Christian, uh, they have all in common. What's the common denominator of all of them? Well, let's read this whole passage out loud together. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I want to ask you this weekend, how do you see the whatever you do? How do you see the whatever you do? And how are you going to spend the whatever you do? How are you going to spend those 100,000 hours of life? Most people see the whatever they do, most people see their job horribly negatively. They see it negatively. And I want to make a case today that most people see their job not as an opportunity to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus that gives glory to God, but they see their job as a prison. They see their job as imprisonment. And you graduate from high school or college And there it comes, the prison sentence, 40 years to life. And this is how people normally see their job. It starts with the first day of the week, Sunday. You've just had a great weekend, and Sunday afternoon comes, and you, it hits you. I have to return to prison. And so Sunday afternoon, you start the grieving process, and you prepare your family and your household for you to be gone for the week and you let them know your availability and what the visiting hours will be. (laughs) And Sunday night, you say, okay, well, what's my last meal going to be? And you prepare a last meal. And you're like, any last words? And we put those on social media, our last words before we return to prison. And Monday, you get out of bed, and you're just walking into work like it's Shawshank Redemption. And... People are lined up taking bets on how far you're going to make it this week. Now, I don't know if he's going to make it to Friday this week. And, and you get in there on Monday and it's just, you know, it's like people are throwing stuff at you. And, the, you know, the inbox is overflowing and the shop is overflowing with cars. And you just go, oh my goodness, I hate Mondays. <laughs> and then on Tuesday rolls around and you go, <laughs> I can't believe I'm getting used to this place. <laughs> the Wednesday kind of looks up a little bit because you're getting over the hump. Mike, 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 it's hump day. <laughs> and then Thursday, the whole diet's out the window because you're rolling in with the biggest frappuccino you can get your hands on just to get through the day. And then Friday, Friday is there's a light at the end of the tunnel and they release you from, you get to leave prison. (laughs) They're gonna let me leave prison. The problem is, it's only on parole. (laughs) And they put you on a leash with a shock collar called a cell phone, and you're on call, and there may be problems, and if you have too much fun or you get too far away, they remind you that you've gotta come back to prison. And you come back to prison on Mondays and you just see your job as this imprisonment that you try to escape. And they bring in coaches and stuff to try to get you to invest because they want to let you out on good behavior early. If, so if you invest right, you may get let out on good behavior. But this is how most people see their jobs. And they end up hating 100,000 hours of their life. And they hate Mondays, and I'll just tell you, If you hate Mondays, you have just decided to hate one-seventh of your life. And this is how we go through our life. And we see our job as a prison. But if God is working, and if Jesus is working, and we're made in God's image, and if before sin, sin entered the world, there was work, there's got to be more to live for. There's got to be more to work for. Well, there's actually six biblical reasons why work is in our lives. Six biblical purposes for work. Six motivations for work. Six reasons. And if you're taking notes, I'll give you the first one. The first one, the most basic 
reason for work is necessity. Write that in. Necessity. We work to meet our needs. We work to stay alive. The Bible says the one who stays on the job has food on the table. God also says that providing for your family is a spiritual responsibility. So friend, when you provide for your family, that's a that's an amazing spiritual thing that God created you to do. You're fulfilling what God has asked you to do. That's no small thing. And we're to take care of our own families as best as possible. When the pilgrims founded America, they made a rule right off the bat. They said, whoever's unwilling to work doesn't share in the meal. Now, where did they get an idea like that? They had a common meal, and the rule was that if you don't work, you don't get to join in on it. And so they get it from 2 Thessalonians 3.10 in the Bible. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now, I want you to notice and circle the word unwilling. Okay, there's no condemnation here. He's not saying can't work. He's saying won't work. He's saying if you can't work, and, and sometimes you can't work. Uh, you're disabled or, or you're sick or for some reason you can't work. But it's saying if you can work, be willing to work. Do your part. Chip in. And God says everybody who can work is supposed to work. But God did not put you on earth just to provide a, a necessity, not just to meet your needs, just to, not to just provide for yourself. God expects you to make a contribution with your life. And you're not, free, you're not free to do nothing for the rest of your life simply because you can afford to do nothing. God puts you on here, uh, on earth, not to be selfish. Proverbs 13, 4 says, lazy people want much but get little. Have you ever noticed that it's kind, of, it's kind of the lazy person who's got the most aspirations and goals and all this kind of stuff? They want much but they get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Prosper. Prosperity is not a dirty word to God. Prosperity is not a dirty word in Christianity. It's not a dirty word in the Bible. God is not opposed to prosperity. Many of the greatest saints in the Bible were very, very, very wealthy. Job, Abraham, David, Solomon, Moses, Lydia, and many, many others. God is not opposed to prosperity. God is opposed to selfishness. God is opposed to that when you use that prosperity, I mean, the gift of America, the gift of the prosperity that we enjoy right now, if we use it and not, not be generous with it, God is opposed to selfish ambition. God is opposed to greed, to pride. But God is not opposed to prosperity. Okay, he's opposed to how you could, certain ways you get that prosperity, but he's not opposed to prosperity. Jesus would praise the businessman whose business skills were used to, to turn a profit. Profit's not a dirty word, it's a good word. And Jesus commends wise business people. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to succeed, but for a reason, and we'll talk about that today. But here's the deal. If necessity, reason number one, to meet my needs, necessity is the only reason you work, you'll see work as a prison. If you just stop at necessity, you'll see your job as a necessary evil. And it's not a necessary evil. Work is not evil. Work is good. And thank God he has more reasons and more purposes for work. In fact, there are, there are five more biblical motivations for having a job. And these reasons will reveal to you something that maybe you haven't noticed about your job. Maybe you even haven't noticed about... It about this illustration right here is that while I'm in this prison, I'm also on a platform. And many people are so preoccupied of seeing their work negatively, seeing it as only a necessity, seeing it uh, only as, as a prison, that they don't recognize the platform that they've been given. And today, I want to show you how you can break out of prison <laughs> To see the platform that you're on. To see the platform God has given you and your job. I want you to move from prison to platform. And I want to show you the five other biblical reasons and motivations for work that move us from prison to platform. So from seeing our job as a necessary evil to something that we're made in the image of God to do and we're fulfilling God's purposes for so let me give you those five more reasons. The second reason why we work, second motivation, second purpose, is identity. Write that in, identity. 
God wants you to work so, he can express, so you can express what he made you to be. He's given you certain gifts and talents. He expects you to use them. Well, it's fulfilling to use them. Proverbs 12, 27 says, a lazy life is an empty life. And we're going to talk about this, our identity more next week and who God made us to be, but God doesn't want you to ignore what he made you good at. Workplace, the workplace is a place to reveal your creativity and ingenuity. Work is a place to make a difference, to give back. Work is a place to express your identity. God has wired each and every one of us differently. Some of you are good at math. Some of you are good at writing. Some of you are great at mechanical things and a craft. Some of you are great at, at leading and seeing certain things. We're all wired differently. Some of you, you walk into a room like this and you see the, the, the chairs that are out of order or not straight or the thing that didn't get done. Some of you walk into a room like this and you see the person sitting alone by themselves. We're all wired differently. We all see things differently. And that's because of the way you're wired. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So with each of these reasons, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a question today. A question that you can ask yourself to start employing this motivation and purpose for work at your job. Now, here's the first one. How do I use the motivation of my identity at work? Ask this question. How can I personally advance the mission? How can I personally advance the mission? Write that in. Now, I've studied this extensively. I, I studied this for a whole year and more. That most companies and places of employment have amazing mission statements, okay, yet they have, they have amazing purposes of existence, yet two-thirds out of people don't like their job. They're unfulfilled, unsatisfied at their job. I think one of the reasons is because they don't know the mission they are on when they are at work, and when you don't know the mission you're on, you feel imprisoned. You feel like a rat in a wheel. So do you know the mission of your workplace? Do you know the mission or vision of your school? Do you know the, the values of your company? Your company or workplace has a mission or vision or pur purpose statement. Do you know it? If you don't know it, how can you personally advance it? I worked for eight years at a UPS store. And not UPS, but at a franchise UPS store. And here's the mission of the UPS store. Our mission is to provide you with the highest quality products and services possible in a timely fashion and at a competitive price. We promise to listen to you and help you achieve your business goals. That's a, that's a mission I could get up under. I, providing something high quality. A promise to listen to people, to help them achieve their goals. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a servant. That sounds like people reaching people, people helping people. I could get up under that mission. The values were world-class customer experience, dedication, community, focus. I can get up under that mission. What's the mission, vision, and values of your company? Do you know them, and are you leaning into how you can personally advance the mission? This week, I looked up the mission statements, commitments, and values of major employers in our area. Raypex School District, Belton School District, Honeywell, different retailers, and several different restaurants in our area. I'll just tell you, I didn't find one mission statement that I didn't think, man, I could get up under that. That's making a difference. That's helping people. Do you know the mission and vision and purpose of your workplace? Now, maybe you will go discover your mission statement and say, whoa, 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 I didn't know that's the mission that we're on. And you don't find anything redeeming about that. You don't find anything redeeming about that. And maybe you can't get on board with that mission. I would encourage you to find a place where you can get on board with the mission. If you, if you own a business and don't have a statement of your mission that's articulating uh, why your business exists, I would encourage you to articulate it in a mission statement. And I'd love to help you do that. I can give you resources or love to talk to you about it. But now that you know the mission that you're on, 
It releases you to express your identity of say, how can I personally advance that mission? Do you know the mission of your workplace? Do you know the mission of this church? Do you know the, the purpose, the mission, the vision of this church? If you come to growth track today, step one of the growth track, or I teach the membership class, you don't have to decide to be a member before you come. You come so I give you all the information you need to make that decision. Uh, there, this afternoon, I'll do it again. I'll just share the purpose and the vision of our church. And I'll walk through why we exist, because Rockbrook Church exists to bring people to Jesus Christ so they can find and fulfill God's purposes for their lives. And I share with you the five biblical purposes for our life. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. And then I show you how we have a process in place, a vision to, to build those into your life. And here's our vision statement. We evangelize our community, bring them in so they can know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. You ask any Rockbrook member, what's Rockbrook Church all about? They would tell you, we help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. And then if you come to step four and join our dream team and start helping us personally advance that mission, we'll show with you our values, who we are, what makes our dream team so unique that we follow Jesus, love people, we remember why, we remember why we're doing it and we choose joy. And you ask any dream team member, what's the values of the dream team? They're gonna tell you, follow Jesus, love people, remember why, choose joy. And I invite you to come, and we'd love for you to have, we need more people helping us personally, using the way God wired you to personally advance the mission. So ask yourself that question. The second reason for work is to express your identity. And when you do that, you begin to, to break out of prison and see your work, not as a prison, but as a platform. Let me give you number three. The third biblical reason for work, the third reason God created work is character, to grow our character. God is far more concerned about who you are than where you work. He is more interested in your character than in your career. God uses your work to develop your character. Work is a life course in character development. D don't raise your hand, but do any of you have a boss that drives you nuts? Anybody have people at your work that drive you crazy? What God does is he plants little seeds of character in your heart. Seeds of love, seeds of joy, seeds of peace, seeds of patience. And then he fertilizes those seeds. You know what work is? Fertilizer. <laughs> it stinks sometimes. But it grows those seeds of love and joy and peace and patience. And most often the fertilizing uh, aspect of growing those things in our life happens in the workplace because we spend so much of our life at work. And God is developing your character here on earth to prepare you for heaven. Life is preparation for eternity. And at work, God is testing you to see if you will be faithful to do the right thing, even when you don't feel like doing the right thing. God is watching you so he can determine what kind of job to give you in eternity. Did you hear that? God is watching you to determine what kind of job he can trust you with in eternity. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, he's just teaching a very basic principle. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little is going to be dishonest with much. He goes on, so... If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And too many people throw up their hands and they say, well, this ain't my business. This ain't my mission. I just work here. And God says, if I can't trust you with someone else's property, why would I give you property of your own? If your attitude is going to be, well, I just work here, it's not my own, I can't give you more. And will you be faithful and trustworthy with someone else's property? Will you be faithful and trustworthy with worldly wealth? And the most important thing you bring home from your job is not a paycheck. The most important thing you bring home is who you are becoming. And when you're looking for a job, the most important question is not what, what will I make? The most important question is what will I become? 
And so here's the question we are to ask ourselves to see if our work is growing our character, and that is, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? If you're out of work and looking for a job, maybe you're in a season of unemployment right now, Christians say that when God closes one door, he opens another. Um, But sometimes you're stuck in the hallway for a while, and the hallway's tough. It's hard in the hallway. And the hallway, though, can be an opportunity for God to completely reinvent you. And when you commit your way to the Lord, he directs your steps. And he may lead you into something uh, new to develop your character. So the decision on what door to walk through has eternal implications because you don't ask yourself just, what will I do at this job? Ask yourself, if I go do that thing with those people, who will I become? Who will I become? And what is it in my character that God wants to develop? Because God wants, he wants to meet your needs. That's the first basic purpose. He wants you to express who he made you to be, your identity. He wants to build your character. And number four, he wants to build your credibility, your credibility. Your work is a witness to other people. The quality of work that you do can open up doors to show your faith. Good work is a good witness. Good work is a good witness. And your work demonstrates what you believe, especially when you're under pressure and people are making unreasonable demands on your life and on your work. How you respond, when you respond in a Christ-like way, is a good witness. And people say, how how can you respond so well there? 1 Thessalonians 4.11 teaches us this. It starts out with, mind your own business. Now let's stop there, okay? (laughs) Nothing turns work into a prison quite like gossip. Nothing imprisons people in their work quite like gossip. Rockbrook people do not gossip at their jobs. They just don't because gossip kills your credibility and it just reveals the immaturity of a character. That's why we don't do it. Gossip reveals where your character is. If you're not, not part of the problem or the solution, you don't need to talk about it. If you're not part of the problem or the solution, you don't need to talk about it. One reason people love being members at Rockbrook Church is because for 21 years now, when you become a member, you sign a covenant that says, I'm not going to gossip. Because we're not going to let gossip ruin the family that is this church, ruin the culture of this church and who we are. So he says, mind your own business and earn your own living, just as we told you before. In this way, you will win the respect of those who are not believers. You will win the respect. Respect is earned. Respect is earned. You have to win respect. And before an unbeliever wants to know if if Jesus is credible, before an unbeliever wants to know if Jesus, the resurrection is credible, if the gospel story is credible, before an unbeliever wants to know if the Bible is credible, they want to know, are you credible? Are you credible? Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, you may work in a dark place. I know some people in our church family who they work in the darkest place imaginable. But light shines better in the darkness. And even even a little light shines bright in a dark room. Let your light shine before others. You can be a witness in a spiritually dark place. So ask this question, how can I shine? How can I shine? God scatters us throughout the darkness to shine a light so that when people see that light, when they see the good work that we do, they'll want to know about our faith. They'll say, how are you so forgiving? How are you so kind? They say, well, that's Christ in me. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And you're shining the light of Christ. Because the fourth reason for work is credibility. Now let's look at the fifth one. The fifth reason God created work is generosity. And if you want God's blessing on your work, you've got to be generous. You've got to be generous. Ephesians 4.28, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. The more generous you are, the more God blesses your work. 
Why? Because God is looking for people to bless. God is looking for people to bless. Might as well be you. Why not? Why not? God wants us to become like him, and God is a generous God. And whenever I give, I become more like him. God is generous. The air I breathe, the sun that warms me, the food on the table, the ability to even work in the first place, it's all a gift from him. And God gives so that you can give to others in need, so that you can give back to him, so that you can further the Great Commission, so you can can help the church. The more you give to God, the more he'll bless you. Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper. Who prospers? The generous. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Maybe you're right in the middle of the grind of a career. You're just right in the middle of it. And you say, how am I going to get a second wind? How am I going to be able to keep doing this? He who refreshes others will be refreshed. Giving unlocks God's blessing on your life. In a lot of businesses, it's not just uh, the employees or the owner who tithes, meaning giving, giving a tenth back to God. The scripturally lays that out. Uh, giving a tenth back to God through the local church we give to God. But it's not just the employees or the, or the owner who will tithe, it's the business that will even tithe, and they'll take the first 10% of their profits and give to God. Guess what? I've seen it time and time and time and time and time again, that God miraculously blesses those businesses. Deuteronomy 8.18, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It, came, it all came from Him. He gave you the ability To what? To produce wealth. Now, did you know that the Bible does not teach wealth redistribution? It teaches wealth creation. That the antidote to poverty is not forced redistribution. It's not to move everybody into poverty. It's the goal is to help people in poverty. God loves the poor. He loves the poor. And he wants to help them. He wants to help make poor people richer. And we have to create new wealth through innovation and motivation. And the Bible says to remember that it's God who gives you that ability and work hard to give to others in need and help them. So I honor God by, by tithing back to him. And I remember that it all came to him in the first place. I'm going to help others to do the same. Acts 20, 38 says, And I have been a constant example, the Apostle Paul talking, of how you can help those in need by working hard. And you should remember the the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said that. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So the question to ask is this. What more can I give? What more can I give? The people who ask this question are the people who understand how much God gave for us. God gave Jesus. God is a generous God. And it's one whole purpose of our work, of why God gives us the ability to work, is to be generous. Let's go to number six. Number six is eternity. I use my job to build God's kingdom. I use my job to build God's kingdom. Well, how do I do that? Well, I use my contacts at work to tell other people the good news. Work becomes your mission field. And you're a kingdom builder. Yeah, wealth builder, that's fine. But you're not just a wealth builder, you're a kingdom builder. You're using your business for the one thing that's going to outlast everything else. Okay, a thousand years from now, the Raypex School District isn't going to be here. A thousand years from now, Belton School District isn't going to be here. A thousand years from now, Honeywell's not going to be here. A thousand years from now, Walmart... McDonald's, all these restaurants, all these retailers, all these uh, companies, all these construction companies, they won't be here. They won't be in business. They won't be here. The only thing that lasts forever is the church, the kingdom of God. And are you building into something temporary or building into something eternal? Are you using your business for the one thing that's going to outlast everything else, the church? Matthew 6.33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. What, what do you need in your work? What do you need in your job? Seek first the kingdom of God, and God will meet those needs. 
And as you do that, look what happens. Matthew 6, 20. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Two words I want you to circle there. For yourselves. Did you know that you can store up treasure for yourself in heaven? It's not for God. He doesn't need it. You store up for yourself. God says that, in a way, you can create a bank account in heaven that is eternal, pays the highest dividends, no one could ever steal it from you, and you can store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. How do you, how do, you do that? By using your work to get people there, through your testimony, through your witness, through funding the Great Commission, through giving to God through the church, and by using your work to get people there. So will I be a wealth builder or a kingdom builder? You can use your work to, to build wealth, make a living, make a profit, nothing wrong with that. But if you stop there, you are incredibly short-sighted. Because there are other purposes for work. And God says, don't just be a wealth builder, be a kingdom builder. And will I be a wealth, just a wealth builder, or am I going to be a kingdom builder? Maybe you've never realized how important your work is. Maybe you'd say, I don't do anything important at work. Anybody could do my job. But your work has far more significance than you may realize because it wasn't meant for simply necessity. God wants to use your work to express your identity, to, for your gifts and talents to be released at work. He wants to use your work to build your character. He wants to make you stronger, more mature, more patient. God wants to use your work to build your credibility. He wants your work not to be a prison, but a platform. He wants you to, to use your work for the sake of the gospel. He wants you to use your work for generosity. He wants you to be selfless and generous enough to live on a little bit less so you can give a little bit more. Or you're not just a wealth builder, you're not short-sighted, but you're eternity-minded and you're a kingdom builder. You can, you can waste your life, you can spend your life, or you can invest your life. And the best use of your life is to invest it in the kingdom of God because it's the only thing that's going to last forever. So here's the question to ask yourself. Ask, where is my reward? Where is my reward? Did you know that one day God is going to do an audit on your work? You're going to have a, a performance review in heaven. <laughs> and there's going to become a time of testing and judgment to see what kind of work each builder has done. And everyone's work will be put through the fire to see if it keeps its value. What's the value? Identity, character, credibility, generosity, eternity. And if the work survives the fire, the person will receive a reward. But if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder, us, you, the builder will still make it into heaven, but it's like someone who just narrowly escapes a fire. Okay, what I'm talking about has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is not on your works, it's on God's work. It's on Jesus Christ's work. Or he lived a perfect life, we could never do that. He died in our place on the cross and he rose from the dead. He gave us eternal life. You can't earn it, we don't deserve it, you can't work for it. It's a free gift of God in his grace, in his generosity. What I'm talking about is rewards. This has nothing to do with salvation, but this is about your position, your job in heaven. And God wants to give you a great reward in heaven. The greater your reward, the greater his glory. That's his motivation. And this is why work is so important. So do you have a prison mindset at work? Do you have a just, I gotta just work here to live and to meet my needs and imprisonment mindset? Or do you have a platform mindset? Your work is far more significant. Are you ready to step up to all of six, all six of God's reasons for your work? Will you say, I'm not going to, God, I'm going to give you my work, not just for one, but for all six of these reasons. Because I want a great reward that gives you great glory in heaven. I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to have an eternity mindset. It's not just for the here and now. This was a lot today. I gave you, I didn't hold back much. I gave you a lot. And just as we move into prayer here, I would invite you uh, to look over your outline and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. What's, what's the thing for this week? What's your next step? What's the, ne what's the thing that you need to start doing? Is there a purpose you're not fulfilling, a question you need to ask yourself? 
a Bible verse that you're going to claim this week in your job as we move from prison to platform. Maybe it's you need to go, go this afternoon, look up the mission statement of, of your company. Maybe you say, man, I'm not, I'm not doing what God's called me to do. With, I mean, the whole, one whole purpose for work is generosity, and I'm not, I'm not doing what he's asked me to do there. I don't know what it is for you, but the Holy Spirit will guide you. We can trust him to do that. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, I realize that while I'm at work, you're working on me. And I want to use my job for all six, six reasons. And God, I just invite you to come and direct me, to guide my steps, and to show me what's next for me today. And maybe someone's here who, who, who they've never trusted in and relied on the work of Jesus Christ. His perfect life his death in our place, that we don't have to suffer death anymore, but through the power of that empty grave, we can have eternal life with him. And just say, God, I want to put my trust in that, in your work. I want to rely on you. Maybe you're just starting out, and just starting out a career or life of work. You're so fortunate to see the purposes of work here early on. I encourage you to keep those close. Maybe you're right in the middle, right in, in the middle of a grind of a career. And I just pray that God would refresh you, that today he would just give you a, a second wind. And maybe you're coming to the close or coming to the end of a career, and I would just encourage you to finish strong. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can finish strong. God, I, I hope I encouraged your people today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.